Hi there and a very warm welcome to this week's video and this week we are going to talk about a topic I can't believe we haven't talked about yet. Well, I mentioned it in sort of this and that video, but I never talked about displacement in general. And this is what we are going to do today within Octane and with the two displacement methods Octane is going to offer, texture displacement and vertex displacement. So, without further ado, Let's grab your coffee and let's keep going. Alrighty, let's talk about texture displacement first. First of all, I don't know what kind of black magic ritual Otoy did to make this happen. What's really amazing with texture displacement is its efficiency and its speed. It doesn't need any more geometry than your base mesh provides, but it can create an astonishing amount of detail on top of it. Of course, it doesn't come without caveats, because every such ritual takes a shard of your soul. And if you look closely, you can see the missing shards right here. So as you see, it can produce artifacts at some points, mostly dependent on the scale, the camera angle and other factors that are really hard to judge. Also, it's reliant on bitmap image textures to load in to function right, so no node magic happening here. And next to the fact that it is reliant on UVs, it has a limit at 8K. With that being said, it's an amazing tool if you know how to work around those caveats. While I built the scene here and it took me a longer time than expected, last night was very short. Actually, to show off what I want to show off, we are going to work in a much simpler scene most of the time. But you can check out the scene and many more from my other tutorials if you become a member on Patreon, no matter what tier. Now, let's move on with the basics. To start, I thought it's a good idea to make a displacement map from a real object and a simple one at that. So this is what we are going to turn into a displacement map. And the approach is remarkably simple, so what we're going to do is map a gradient alongside the object, so we go from black to white at the height. Unintentional rhyme here. So this is all still Cinema 4D, so what we have here is a material with a luminance, and in the luminance there's a gradient set to linear on both of those knots. And this is mapped with the flat mapping to the side of the object, and then what we can do is go inside of a camera that is set to top view. Here we go. And this is our displacement if we render. And this way I made countless displacement maps throughout the years. The only thing you have to remember with this method is that the surface here needs to be flat. So no round object with the camera from the top trick. The only other thing I might want to do is go to the object and then sample the highest and lowest point and then see what the difference here is and oh wonder it's 100 millimeters. Okay, so let's move over to Octane. Welcome to Octane land. So if we render, we have a plane here. I took the liberty to already create that. But let's actually create the displacement material. So let's create a diffuse material and then go into it. And you can see already there should be a displacement port here. So let's move to the displacement if we can find it and then add displacement. Here we go. Turn on our snapping because I really like that. And then we need something to go in there. Let's actually start the worst possible way and then move up on our food chain by plugging in a JPEG and then also assigning the material, of course. This doesn't look half bad, but if we assign the real height, so 100, you can see, ah, uh, it does. Octane's default is the texture displacement and if you want to switch to vertex displacement, which of course we are going to take a look later on, then this is the switch. Okay, so let's go down the pipe here. Let's actually talk about the elephant in the room, our displacement result. We have a couple of things that are really wrong here. For example, here we have curved surfaces, whereas the original had straight ones. Also, the whole thing looks kind of low res, and this is something we can mitigate in the shader. 
So let's go to the texture and see its resolution. It's 2K. What we can do is go over to our displacement and set it to the same number. And here we go. We don't have those low res edges anymore. What we still have is those curved surfaces. And maybe you know where this is coming from and you go, ah, why not go into the texture and set the gamma to one or actually set the whole thing to non-color data. And nothing is happening. Now, while this would work for vertex displacement, texture displacement, on the other hand, ignores almost everything of the input parameters here. The only thing I know is working is the invert button. And since Octane's texture displacement is ignoring all the settings, you have to do that outside of the app. So what I'm talking about is linearizing the image. Let's instead bring in a linear JPEG here. Here we go. And then you can see <laughs> what's happening with 8-bit. Let's move a little bit closer. So by using a linear image, by the way, if you save out a linear image on this scene, you don't have to do anything, just bring it in here. You get the straight slope, but due to the limited steps from 8-bit images, which are 256, you get a lot of stepping as well as artifacts from the JPEG compression. The reason I know those are compression artifacts is that if I bring in a TIFF file of the same nature, you can see those are gone. And overall, it looks much more coherent. Of course, when I drag in a 16-bit TIFF, the representation becomes even better, but not perfect though. And I would say 16-bit PNGs or TIFFs are the minimum that you should use for displacement. What surprised me is, despite its nature of being floating point, a 16-bit EXR isn't doing anything else than the TIFF file is. So last but not least, this comes to no surprise if you don't want to get steps anyway and have the most perfect rendition you get with a 32-bit EXR with a lossless compression. As I think you won't encounter those slopey situations very often, 16-bit TIFFs is a good middle ground. What I want to do next is talk about the UV aspect of the texture projection. Because as we established before, if I delete the UV map, the displacement is gone. So what I've done is very simple. I grabbed my soap and brought it into Rhizom UV, my favorite UV unwrapping software, unwrapped it there and then brought it back to Cinema 3D. Of course, I'm the person who says that having good UVs on your object is a nice thing to have, but you might be surprised that I also say that it isn't even necessary for the texture displacement, although we need UVs. And this comes with a little help of Cinema 4D, or better yet, the way Octane for Cinema 4D was written. So if we go to one of our material tags and then go to projection, you can see we are using the UVs here right now. So the projection and the displacement is working, but we have all sorts of other projections at our disposal. Despite being real projections for Cinema 4D, Octane receives those as UV maps. So if we go for a cubic projection, for example, we still see displacement working. So what I do rather often is go to flat mapping then go to the texture projection gizmo inside of Cinema 3D and then we can rotate that around 90 degrees. Here we go. And then we can move it around and place our logo where we want it. Now you can see shards of our hearts turning up here again. And as I think we covered all the essential bits, let's go into a gacha section. Hold up, I'm getting old, I'm forgetting stuff. There's one more thing. For that, let's go back to UVW projection and bring in another map here. This will look very funny. So here we go. A displacement map produced with the same technique mentioned before. What is actually also supported by displacement is the transform here. So UV transform. Of course, it has the name UV in it. With this and smaller tileable maps, you can produce a really vast amount of detail so if we make this really, really small, you can see what kind of detail you can produce here. Of course, you have to be a little bit careful, otherwise you render times will get out of hand. But now to the gotchas, at least I think. 
Alrighty, let's start with a small one to get you warmed up. A lot of the time when you have artifacts around your displacement, what you actually can do is a trick that almost always works when you have artifacts, and this is lowering the ray epsilon, so press another zero in there, therefore you get more detail. Now, while we are at it, the next one seems a little bit counterproductive, but sometimes can really help to mitigate artifacts and increase the fidelity. And this is raising the level of detail to the highest possible number, even though your texture might not support it pixel-wise. Let's stay with our cube for a little bit, so what the algorithm here is not liking at all is 90 degree edges. And despite being a valid solution for vertex displacement, subdividing the cube makes it even worse. The only method I found to mitigate that is basically blurring your image texture, so you don't have the 90 degree edge, but a slope. Of course, grading slopes other ways than blurring images can also be beneficial and helping. So welcome to a two-in-one gotcha. One, you have those outward leaning displacements that you don't want. We can mitigate those by going to the direction and follow geometric normal, but then you get those horrid edges here. So the actual best way to do that is not with the direction change, but with a supporting edge on the cube. So let me do that. You can either do that manually, but I will do that with a bevel here and then increase the edge, set this back to the old method, and then you can see those edges are curving around. Now, if they don't look good yet, we come to our second gacha, and this is the mid-level. You can always move that around. Basically, it sets the starting point from black to white. So 0.5 means that half of it goes inward, half of it goes outward. Zero means that all of it goes outward. And one, of course, means that all of it goes inward. So let's go with a 0.5 here. I think that looks good. If you want to avoid those artifacts, you need to have the UVs wrap around here. Okay, let's get back to our sharty soap. That sounds horrible. I don't want to ever have a sharty soap in my bathroom. Here, the idea is to restrict the displacement just to the portion where we need it. So let's select the soap, go into polygon mode, and then just go and select the polygons where we need the displacement, select store selection, and then apply that to the material. Of course, we need a material for the rest of it, so we are going to duplicate our original material, then go into the settings and turn it off from displacement. Then, not compromising on the border here, we need to have the same projection than the old material had, so we duplicate that, and then exchange that one here. Now, the last thing we need to do is go to the tag and delete the selection. Here we go, no more soul shards small addition here, so the level of course has to be the same level as the original object, so of course if I change that, then the whole thing wouldn't work. So in this case, where we want to have white sit flush, we need the mid-level of one. Another gotcha worth knowing, especially if you export 32-bit displacement maps, for example, out of ZBrush, Octane will unfortunately clamp everything below zero and above white. So to show you, I have an exposure here, so let's set this to 1, so we get double the height to prove that we still have informations. Yes, you can see the numbers chewing here. So let's save this and go over to Cinema 3D and bring it in. And as you can see, it's clamped. No bueno. You will need something like vertex displacement for that. Welcome to the last gotcha for now. So let's say we have a logo and you want to have it as high res as possible. So you max out the estate of your 8K texture here, but let's say it should be only covering a small portion of the object. So as we established before, we can use the transform. So let's do this, transform, and then transform it down. So something like this size here, let's say this is good. Now you have a problem with the logo repeating all over because you only want it to be there. And you might say, oh, that's not a problem. We go into the material and then go wrap around and set it to white or black color, for example. Here we go. Only one logo is left. But with the difference, 
that the texture displacement doesn't care. Unfortunately, this leaves us no choice but to do the same thing as with our soap. So we need to get a selection going in the top left here. Let's do this by moving the material. Here we go. Move it up and then to the left. Something like that. Let's see if that's our original logo here. Yes, we moved it right. Actually, it doesn't matter that much. It just matters that there is a logo at the edge. So let's convert our plane by hitting C. Go to the cutter tool KL and then cut both sides in here. Something like that. Then go and select the polygon again. Select store selection. Go to our material and set the selection here. And now we have a logo at the top left. To prove my point, it is really, really high res. And last but not least, I said in the very beginning that mixing textures also doesn't work, and this is correct. But as a small bonus, there is a workaround as well, and this comes with the baking texture. So if we search for that, we can rebake everything that comes in here. So then it is pixels again, and then it also works again. Of course, this takes extra compute, and also we need to take care of the resolution and the type. So right now it's set to low dynamic range, and we want it to be high dynamic range, and maybe a little bit more pixels. Here we go. Also, of course, this within itself has its limitations, but this would be too far in for this video. So you can try your luck here. And that's already it for today. If you're now going... That can't be it. Where's the rest of it? You are absolutely right. The second part is missing. I opted to split this into two parts since the first part already had so much going on. Next week you can look forward to a collaboration project. I'm really looking forward to this one. As always, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for sticking with me. Let's thank those people who made this video possible. Of course, my patrons, especially my 50 euro tier subscribers, Shields Augustinen, Just a Frickin, and Leon Studio TV. Also, of course, a huge thank you for my 15 euro tier subscribers, for the Thieves, Render King, Alessandro Bonchio, Alessio De Vecchi, Andrew Niehaus, BVR, Chris Fritschi, Christian Grajewski, Erbe Plus Academy, George Luna, Graham Bagnell, James Conkle, Joel Mackemer, John Edward, Ludger, Muradan Axos, Nico Straub, Part 1 of 2, Quok an Dang, Ralf, Random Capibara, Raiko, Renato Marquez, Reshock, Shamos Johnson, Shiro 2049, Terry Wayne Ranson, and Yasin Rupp. Thank you all so very much for making it possible to produce those videos that you all enjoy. Welcome to the Displaced After Show Party. As I mentioned, it was a very short night for me, so my priority was to finish this one video before falling asleep. If you're still watching and listening, of course, thank you very very much. I think part 2 of this will follow the week after next week, because next week there's the collaboration project. Hopefully you like this one. If you want to show your support, let's post a soap in the comments down below. And that's it for this week. I hope you had a great weekend and have a good start into next week, or simply a good time if you're watching this sometime later. Thank you again, and happy stanceling. Bye.